And we're off, my friends. Uh, how are you all today? Good to be with you for this next class for the uh, RCIA and Adult Faith Formation. Let's, let me zoom myself out of here a little bit. So uh, our class today is on uh, moral virtues and Christian discipleship, right? Two very important topics for the life of the Christian disciple. Uh, and it, it flows from, uh, in so many ways, I look at this quote from Mark, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, it, it's not an automatic thing, right? Uh, it's not just something that is universal. Uh, what must I do? Uh, and, and so there's something to do, and as we'll see, uh, not just something uh, to avoid, but something that we must do to inherit eternal life. Whoever wishes to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The path of discipleship is likened here to Jesus carrying the cross. Wow. Meaning that there are difficulties. It's not uh, just do whatever we want to do. It's not just avoid every possible uh, obstacle in the path, but uh, surging through it, carrying the cross through difficulties and even persecutions, uh, as so many millions down through the centuries have done. So uh, we'll talk about all of these things uh, as we uh, as we get close now to wrapping up the course. So going forward, let's begin our, with our prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, ineffable Creator, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all things, be pleased to cast a beam of your radiance upon the darkness of my mind. Take from me the double darkness of sin and ignorance in which I was born. Give me quickness of understanding, a retentive memory, the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally, and abundant grace of expression. Order the beginning, direct the progress, and perfect the achievement of my work, you who are true God and true man, and who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. So there we are. So, uh, what is a virtue? We're talking about the virtuous life. We've talked about the vices, you'll remember, a few weeks back, a couple months back, I guess. Uh, the, uh, with the seven deadly sins or the, the vices. So what is a virtue? All right. Uh, this is from the Catechism. Virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It allows the person not only to perform good acts, but, but to give the best of himself. The virtuous person tends toward the good with all his sensory, sensory and spiritual powers. He pursues the good and chooses it in concrete actions. It's a whole lot going on in that definition there. Uh, first of all, it's a, uh, a habitual, right? Uh, 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 virtue is habitual. So uh, can you perform a single virtuous act? Does that make you virtuous? Well, not really, <laughs> or not necessarily, right? It's as a, hab a habit of doing virtue, right? And a firm disposition to do that. While I do something good and virtuous, no, this is a firm disposition to do the good. Uh, I not only do good acts, perform good acts, but you, I want to give the best of myself. And this is, again, right, that, that great contrast with the vices that were always, uh, you will remember, focused on the self, right? Give me, it's what I want. It's the exaltation of the self, right? Uh, the virtues are, are just the opposite. It's the giving of the self, right? Yeah, so I, I, the virtuous person gives him the best of himself. The virtuous person tends toward the good. And I like this, this idea. Uh, uh, the nature of sin is such that the more involved we are with sin, the more we tend to commit sin, right? The, uh, the more we're, we're doing something, we're sort of predisposed to, doing, uh, to committing a sin. The virtue is just the opposite. We're now pre, pre, uh, pre propose, uh, and say we're trying to uh, predisposing ourselves toward doing the good. All right, toward doing the virtues. And it comes uh, through, again, through this developing of this habit. We pursue the good. It's not just every once in a while we stumble across something good and we do it. We're actively pursuing the good, see, and choosing it in concrete actions. Another very important part. You know, it's just not, not we can't be virtuous uh, in a theoretical way, all right? It has to be in a concrete action in our lives, here and now, choosing virtuous things, and in that sense, in a habitual way. 
So you start to see, just as we pick apart that definition, that it is a challenge, right? And it, it, it is the task of the Christian, the, the project of his life, uh, to develop these virtues. And by the way, the good is, and we say pursuing the good, doing the good, it's not just what we decide the good is. It's what God decides uh, what the good is. Well, we'll hit this a little bit more. Uh, and as we talked about uh, earlier, you know, it's what our conscience properly informed teaches us that is the good. It's what God decides what is the good. And it's uh, if we are ourselves are the ones deciding it, then we're no better than the animals, right? Uh, then, then being a Christian uh, is, is no different than doing anything else, right? We are following God's definition of the good and seeking to pursue it. So a virtuous person is not just he who knows what is right and wrong, but one who consistently does right and consciously avoids wrong. Okay? So virtue consists in making a free and deliberate choice to act well in pursuit of the good. All right, that makes sense. It's a deliberate. I will do good. Right? I will choose to act virtuously. It's a choice. And as we said, uh, the more that choice happens, the more, the more, the easier it is to make that choice. Like anything else, right? The pursuit and attainment of the good leads to true happiness. True happiness. Not necessarily immediate happiness. Sometimes to, to act virtuously, we have to we have to sacrifice something, right? And so in the immediate future, well, we're giving up something. We're sacrificing something that we might otherwise want. Uh, but we're not in the pursuit of our immediate happiness. We're in the pursuit of our true and lasting happiness, which ultimately is eternal life with God. That is our ultimate goal. And so all of our choices are tending toward that even if that means we are, we are encountering things in the immediate time that are sacrifices or things that we don't want or that don't make us immediately happy. So thus the virtuous life is the happy life. It really is, deep down. The life that leads to the ultimate happiness in the kingdom of heaven and the beatific vision, as we've said. So that, though it is true that only humans can act virtuously, and it's even more true to say that Acting virtuously is what makes, what truly makes us human and separates us from the animal world. Well, uh, of course, uh, only humans can act virtuously. Right? That's what separates us from animals. You remember all of the vices uh, that we discussed tend to be our, uh, our, uh, those, those, those instincts, those appetites that are our, the, the base of our nature, right? That, that we share with the animals. Uh, you're hungry, you go get something to eat. Uh, the, the animal, uh, it's, it's in their season. They go do what they do, right? Uh, we're not like that, right? We can act virtuously. Uh, I have a dog. Uh, many of you have pets. I have a dog, and she's a good dog. Uh, is she a virtuous dog? No. Uh, no, it's not taking anything away from her. She's a good dog. But uh, virtue is a human concept here. Only a human being can act thinking, right? You have to choose to do the good, right? And that is a uniquely human act. In the same way, uh, failing to act virtuously, acting solely on the basis of instinct and the satisfaction of appetites, that's something we'd share with the animals, right? An animal can do that and does that. And that's all an animal can do. But only the human can act virtuously. So you could say that it's what truly makes us human, is acting virtuously. So we've spoken much about sin and its consequences, and rightly so, right? Uh, uh, as we say, you know, if, if we don't if we don't think we're 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 committing sins, and we don't think that uh, there's sin in the world, then, then we have no need for a savior. And so uh, so it's important to understand what a sin is and such. But the Christian life has more to do than simply avoiding sin. That's a good start and a necessary first step. But the Christian life has to be more than just simply avoiding wrong. It has to be more than that. We actively seek out the will of God. Right? Not just avoiding things that are against his will. Again, a good start. But now, act 
actively seeking out the will of God. Ooh, and that it may be fulfilled by my virtuous concrete actions. So, and actively strive to live the virtues, actively desiring to please God with our lives. Right? We, we don't just want to avoid offending God. Again, a good start. I want to actively please God with the choices that I make through a virtuous life. Why? Because we love God, right? And so that what a beautiful thought. So a slave lives in fear of his master, right? And is scared of offending him, right? But Jesus says, I called you friends. Uh, a friend of God loves him, and because of that love, desires to please him. Beautiful. Beautiful relationship that Christ offers us with our Creator, with the eternal God. So the habitual nature of of the virtues. We've talked about this. Uh, it is a habit, right, that is formed, just like vice is. It is a habit. A habit forms when an act is repeated enough times to where one acquires the disposition to act, kind of like muscle memory for the for our morality, right? Uh, but so doing the, the same act, whether virtuous or a vice, will lead us to be predisposed toward that act every time we come into that situation. So who we are is determined by our overall character. Our character is determined by the habits that we cultivate. Our habits are formed by strings of individual actions, right? Repeated over and over. And our actions begin with the will, right? We will to do an action. And willing begins in our thoughts. Ooh. So this whole person that we become, our character, our habits, our actions, our will, our, begins just in our thought. So there's a strong connection between thinking rightly and acting rightly. So you say, yeah, that's why uh, Christ commands us, uh, you know, in our thoughts and in our words, uh, uh, to be even uh, striving after virtue there. When we come across, uh, when, we can, when we catch ourselves, if you will, thinking uh, an un unholy thought, right, to stop it, right, to not let thoughts uh, fester in our minds. Uh, that can lead us then to willing something that is evil. So uh, it's right at the level of the thoughts uh, that, we, that we begin to form our actions, our habits, and our very character. So among the virtues, we're talking about virtues, there are four that I'm going to talk about first, and these are called the cardinal virtues. So this comes from the Latin word meaning hinge, and the idea is that all of the other virtues we may talk about hinge around these four. So the cardinal virtues are natural virtues. Now this means that they are attainable by any person of goodwill. They are perfections of human nature as such. And as we'll say, they're, as we're going to see, they're, they're designed uh, to be developed toward leading a good earthly life, right? They're kind of earthly virtues. Doesn't mean they're bad, just means that they're earthly virtues human virtues. So the four cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude, right? So let's briefly define each one of them. Prudence, the virtue that makes use of practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. All right. So note uh, our true good, not just an immediate or lesser good. Right? So uh, let's give you a, a silly example. Uh, you're hungry. Uh, you go to the hotel uh, buffet, and you see a cheeseburger, and you say, all right, I'm going to get the cheeseburger. Is that uh, our true good? I mean, well, um, I'm satisfying my immediate appetite. So that's good. Well, maybe not. We're talking our true good, right? So maybe our true good is to maintain a healthy life. So I should, instead of the cheeseburger, I should have right next to it the kale salad, right? But it's, again, a little bit of a sacrifice, but it's in pursuit of the true good, right? And prudence is that virtue that helps us make our use of our practical reason, not just our appetites, to discern, well, what is my true good? in every circumstance, and to choose the right means of achieving it. So, in this case, I'll choose the kale salad. Now, do I go steal it, right? <laughs> so, do I go out to the hotel? He's no one's looking. I just take it, right? 
again, I'm choosing the true good, but I also have to choose the right means of, of achieving it. Right? So the idea of, uh, it, it, yes, not instead of stealing it, I got to pay for it. It's prudence that immediately guides the judgment of our conscience. Right? And that, yeah, so our conscience tells us what is our true good and what is the right way of achieving it. Again, as we said before, our conscience uh, must be well, well formed according to the mind of God as revealed by the church and not just, you know, uh, uh, we, we have this wrong idea of conscience these days that it's just whatever I feel like doing. That's not your conscience. That's your appetites. That's your, uh, that's your, uh, your base insta instincts that we share with the animals. Our conscience has been developed right, to know the good, uh, to using prudence, to know the true good and the true ways of achieving it. So with the help of the virtue of prudence, we apply moral principles to particular cases without error and overcome doubts about the good and to achieve and the evil to avoid. And this makes it a very powerful virtue. All right? We apply our moral principles to particular cases. So there's a particular case where I'm hungry. And, 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 all right, and so do I eat the cheeseburger or the kale salad? Uh, well, again, uh, to overcome doubts about what the good is and what evil to avoid. Well, in a real moral situation, I need to know uh, what is the moral principle that should guide me in this particular case and the best way of achieving that. Keep in mind that prudence can never leave a, lead us to do evil, like all the virtues, right? we, and like our conscience. Our conscience can never uh, approve the carrying out of an evil act, right? And so some people, uh, uh, and some people, un unfortunately, think, "Well, in my conscience, I feel like I can do this." Wrong, right? You, you can never do your conscience can never approve an evil act. In the same way, prudence, which informs the conscience, uh, will never lead us to do evil. The next one's temperance, uh, the Goldilocks virtue, right? So it's the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. So it ensures the will's mastery over instincts and keeps desires within limits of what is honorable. So again, our silly example. Uh, okay, you have the cheeseburger. Do you have 10 cheeseburgers? No, you have one. You, know, you moderate it, right? It's fine. And it's, not, it, it's a pleasure, right? Or you want to have a bowl of ice cream. Great. Have a, you don't eat the whole gallon of ice cream. You have a little bowl of ice cream. That, that, that's the idea applied now to the moral life. Uh, our idea here is that our will should exert mastery over our instincts, our appetites, right? Uh, uh, we're not animals. If you put a bowl, of, put a bone in front of a dog, it's going to eat it, right? right? I'm not talking about training and their behavior modification. I'm talking about just the instinct of the dog. You put something down in front of it, it's going to eat it. We are the only ones that can act virtuous and say, well, I shouldn't really be eating that gallon of ice cream because I, you know, uh, I'm trying to watch my sugar, I'm trying to watch my weight, whatever. The will exercises mastery over the instinct, a true human act that separates us from the animals. When we act on instinct alone, we're sharing it with the animals. Uh, the virtue of temperance says, Yes, we can enjoy this pleasure because it is a pleasurable thing to have ice cream, but in a way, but not to go overboard, right? It's the idea that the person does not use creative goods too much or too little, but acts with moderation. Uh, again, the Goldilocks virtue, just right, right? By the way, we can never do something evil, even in moderation, right? Evil is completely to be avoided. So this is talking about the good things of the world, uh, like food is a good example. I uh, like doing anything, I like rest and relaxation. They're all good things, but if we overindulge in any of them, we begin to slide away. And where the body goes, the spirit soon follows. So the mastery that we uh, have over our instincts and appetites um, also has a great benefit in the spiritual life. It's one of the reasons why we fast during Lent. In other words, giving up something. We, we're, we're exercising. We're not giving up something bad during Lent, right? Um, so some people, is this a time to, 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 uh, to get rid of the, the bad things in our life? Well, yeah, sort of. But that's, 
we should be doing that all year round, right? It's never a good thing to engage in something evil. Uh, Lent is about uh, giving up good things, not evil things. I mean, we're always giving up evil things. Uh, but Lent's about giving up good things. Uh, uh, why? To take mastery over our instincts to, that, that keep us on the earthly level so that we are thinking more of the heavenly level. Right? That's where we're always going. So temperance helps us do that by moderating our earthly appetites such that we are more predisposed to consider the things of God. Justice is the next one, and that's the virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. What is owed to God and neighbor? And what do I need to do to ensure that God and neighbor get what is owed to them? So justice toward God, we and we can be just toward God. And that that's called the virtue of religion. And that's everything from uh, recognizing him as our creator, recognizing him as the one who determines good and evil, uh, going to mass on Sunday and rendering worship unto him. That is his due. As we say in the mass, uh, it is right and just. Right, that we praise him, right? Uh, justice toward neighbors uh, disposes us to respect the rights of each, establish in human relationships the harmony that promotes equity and with regard to persons and the common good. Right? All of those things are the, the, the natural virtue of justice. And it is, remember, it is never just to do evil uh, toward God or man. And finally, fortitude, the last of the cardinal virtues. The moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties, constancy in the pursuit of the good. Because let's face it, sometimes pursuing the good is difficult. And, and it, you, the, the first obstacle that comes up, we're like, ah, forget it. You know, I, I try to do good, but, uh, you know, it's going to become difficult. No, we need to power through uh, doing good. That's what makes a truly virtuous person is one that does the good and pursues it even through difficulties. And we need that virtue of fortitude. Uh, it strengthens the resolve to resist temptations and to overcome those obstacles in the moral life. Virtue of fortitude enables one to conquer fear, even the fear of death, and to, fire, and to face trials and persecutions. Right? In other words, that highest good that I'm pursuing is involves, in this, in a, in, say in a particular case, uh, maintaining firm my faith despite the persecutions that may come my way. And we need the virtue of fortitude uh, to maintain our stance in the face of that obstacle, maintain our faith and our public witness of the faith. It disposes one even to renounce and sacrifice his life in defense of a just cause. So the virtue of fortitude. So those are the, the, the four cardinal virtues. And each one of them, as we said, are human ones. But there is something else that we call theological virtues that are even higher. So while the cardinal virtues are ordered toward living a good life on earth, the theological virtues relate directly to God and to the life to come. Though, of course, they will have ramifications in this life. So the cardinal virtues are the result of, of human efforts and repeated striving to develop those good habits uh, for the good. The theological virtues we're going to talk about are infused in us by God at our baptism. They are not the result of human efforts. Uh, they are given to us by God, and they are great gifts from God and flow from Him. They inform the cardinal virtues and help shape them to reflect heavenly aspirations. So while the cardinal virtues are natural earthly virtues that anyone can develop, the theological virtues given to us by God will inform those other cardinal virtues and shape them toward heavenly life, right? Which is our ultimate goal. And those virtues are faith, hope, and charity. Those are the theological virtues. Let's define each quickly. So faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. We believe in his existence, right? We believe in him. And we believe all that he's said and all that he's revealed to us and all that Holy Mother Church proposes for our belief because he is truth itself. So we believe that God exists and we believe that he is intimately involved in our life 
and uh, in, in, in the life of his creation. We believe that uh, everything that we've talked about uh, with the uh, sending of the, the, of, of the prophets and uh, eventually the sending of his own son, we believe that, therefore, that he is intimately involved and he's revealing himself to us. And we have faith in what he has said. And that, therefore, that faith, that belief, causes us to change our direction, causes us to uh, change ourselves. We, we become a different person because, well, if we believe in this, then that means I will make a de decision that is different from what I would otherwise make because I believe. And going further with that, by faith man freely commits his entire self to God. If I believe that God exists, he is my creator. I give my gift, I give myself to him. Right? Uh, and as we've seen already, and the great proclamation of the church is that God has already given himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ upon the cross. So I make a free commitment to give my entire self back to him. And so for this reason, the believer seeks to know and do God's will. And again, not just avoiding evil, but seeking it out. What is his will? And how may I do it? From the Catechism, the disciple of Christ must not only keep the faith and live it, but also profess it, confidently bear witness to it, spread it, even amidst persecutions, which the church never lacks. This doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be on the street corner with your Bible, uh, given sermons. Uh, but at the same time, we live it. Um, it should not be a secret that you are a Christian disciple, right? If anyone has to ask, you know, I, I had no idea what his faith is. Uh, maybe, maybe we might say, am I, am I hiding it? Am I not living it? Am I going along with the crowd? Am I not demonstrating by my choices, my words, uh, my actions, the things I do, the things I refuse to do? And that I'm not, uh, that I'm just like everybody else. Uh, faith is says, no, we have to bear witness to it and spread it, even amidst persecutions. From Matthew, Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, friends, and I, and I think this would be. Uh, <laughs> The, the sweetest words any of us want, will ever want to hear is to stand before the judgment seat of Almighty God and the moment of our death and Jesus Christ comes up to me and, and looks at his, puts his arm around you and says, and says to the Father, I acknowledge this one as one of mine because he acknowledged me while he was on earth. That you want to hear, all right? Whatever, whatever, that you want to hear, right? More than anything else, for sure. The theological virtue of hope. This is the virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness, placing our trust in God's promises, relying not on our own strength, but on the help, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Right now, again, now look how this is going to inform all of our decisions on earth. I desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as my happiness, as my true goal. Therefore, anything that's going to lead me there, I will do. Anything that will lead me away from that, I will not do. And, and so you see how that informs every other decision. In the same way, when things are going great in my life, I'm always remembering, yeah, but as good as things are in my life right now on earth, my highest happiness is in heaven. And in the same way, when things are going bad on earth, I, 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 it keeps me from getting too depressed. Because why? I said, yes, but my highest happiness is not on this earth. Uh, it, it's in heaven, and that is what I'm pursuing, despite whatever's going on on earth. So hope always keeps our minds up in heaven. It always keeps our minds on our ultimate goal. It responds to that aspiration of happiness, which uh, God has placed in every one of our hearts, and realizes he's the one that can fulfill it. So it takes up our hope that inspires activities, purifies them as to order them to order them to the kingdom of heaven. That's where we want to go. And it keeps us again from discouragement. It's the saints is in times of abandonment. It opens up his heart and expectation of eternal beatitude. I said, I know no matter what's going on on earth, I'm remaining faithful to my Lord 
and I, I have an expectation of eternal beatitude. I'm confidently expecting heavenly bliss, right? Not in a presumptive way, but that I place my hope in him. So, and I know he will not disappoint me if I remain faithful. So we hope in the glory of heaven promised by God to those who love him and do his will. That's what the virtue of hope is. And finally, charity. So the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and our neighbors ourselves for the love of God. Ooh, what a, what a definition. As we're going to see, notice what's, a, what's not included in the definition, ourself. It's the practice of all the virtues. Uh, it's animated by charity, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Right? Again, always focusing on the love of God for his own sake, love of neighbor because of the love of God. It's the form of the virtues, we might say. It articulates and orders them all among themselves. It's the source and goal of their Christian practice. We might say that charity upholds and purifies our human ability to love and raises it to the, to the supernatural perfection of divine love. Now, uh, we will sometimes, you'll, you'll hear the theological virtues mentioned as faith, hope, and love. And, and that's, that's fine. That's fine. I, I do prefer to use charity when we're talking about this. Uh, let's face it, you know, love uh, has a multitude of meanings in English uh, that have nothing to do with charity, right? So... Um, Everything from puppy dog love to soap opera love to uh, all kinds of love, right? Uh, uh, charity, uh, I think, is a better word to use when describing the virtue in that it, it, it's now we're, we're elevating just the human nature of love to the divine nature. Charity is perfectly in, uh, given, uh, perfectly um, illustrated for us in Jesus Christ on the cross. Right? That is charity total pouring out of self for love of God and love of neighbor, right? That's the proper idea. It's love of God for his own sake, not because of what he can give me. Right? And love of neighbor for their own sake and for the love of God. You know, I, I will love my neighbor. I will choose the good for my neighbor um, for my neighbor's own sake and because I love God. Now, again, I'm not doing it because of what and how it makes me feel what I get out of it, what people will think of me doing it. It's for love of God and love of neighbor. See what? See how that's elevated beyond the, the earthly realm and really becomes an imitation of Christ and his love for us, his charity. The preeminent virtue. All right, if you get this one right, uh, you're going to get all the other ones right. No. So let me uh, pause here, and uh, the, the machine here likes us to keep things um, uh, a little short, so I'll pause here, and we'll pick up on, pay on the second half in a moment.